You were meant to be a person of impact. You were made by God to count. And we're learning today in the master class. We're, we're going to be learning from masters of the spiritual life, people who walked closely with God and made a deep impact on their world. Right now, it's a man named Ignatius, Ignatius of Loyola. And I want to talk about one of the primary prerequisites if I want to be able to impact the world around me, I need to have a realistic view of what that world actually consists of. And that actually begins with a realistic understanding of myself. I must become deeply self-aware. I must be willing to examine myself rigorously. And very few people have ever done this or passed more help along to other people more than Ignatius of Loyola. I talked... Uh, last time we were discussing his life about the role that setbacks and challenges and frustrations and disappointment played. He thought he was going to be a great soldier and a courtly romantic figure. And then he was injured and humiliated by losses. And then it took him a long time to figure out what did it mean to follow God and serve God. Chris Lowney writes about him. Uh, how do you become a successful effective person of impact. If Loyola's suggested route involves a wrecked leg, a year-long pilgrimage, a year of intense meditation, and a couple of arrests, most sane people would say no thank you, and opt instead for the old-fashioned way to get to the top, get an MBA, and hit yourself to a powerful mentor. However, he goes on, if it were not for Loyola's mishap, militarily and his injury, for his difficulties and for his setbacks, very possibly, he would never have taken profound stock of his strengths, weaknesses, values, and life goals. And if he had not grappled with that, if he had not grappled with who he was and what he most deeply believed and what personal resources he had and why he had failed along the way, only by asking, asking and answering these questions does one develop the capacity to make an impact in life. So let's think for a few moments about what does it take to have an honest appraisal of myself and my life, who I am, who I want to be, and what gets in the way. Our old friend Lou Smeads writes in one of his books, a pretty good person, about the great problem that we're addressing here. And it's what Lou calls a corrupted consciousness. That is, our ability to distort the thoughts that we have in a way that will serve the viewpoint that we would like to adopt of ourselves and other people and the world around us. And he talks about how nations are very capable of this. How in 1930s Great Britain, the leadership viewed Adolf Hitler as a reasonable man because they wanted to view Adolf Hitler as a reasonable man. They did not want to face up to what it would take to combat him if he wasn't reasonable. And of course, he was not. Lou writes about how Albert Speer, who for many years was Hitler's favorite, writes uh, in almost a comical vein about Nazis Germany attempt to distort its understanding of reality. For quite a while, English bombers were just pelted effectively by the Germans. And then eventually, the United States started sending in jets to accompany them, and things changed. A certain General Galland reported to Field Marshal Gehring that American fighter planes had joined the battle for the German skies. The Germans had shot one down, so they knew for sure that now America was in the sky. Gehring screamed, that's nonsense, Galland. What gives you such fanatic ideas? But, sir, they were there. Gehring said, I herewith give you an official order. They were not there. Do you understand? The American planes were not there. And, of course, reality is not the kind of thing that you can change by issuing an order. But we all try to do that. Not just nations, but individuals. Lou goes on. We close our minds to reality we do not want to be real. A mother sees clear signs that her son is on drugs, but closes her eyes. It would hurt too much to know. A husband shuts out clear signals his wife is having an affair. It would hurt too much to know. Getting older, a teacher closes his mind to signals from students that his lectures are rambling misadventures and boredom. It would hurt too much to know. A famous teacher of theology at a great American seminary lived a notoriously wild and illicit sex life. After he died and the truth was published in a book by his indulgent widow, 
I asked a colleague of his how it was that nobody at the seminary knew. We all knew, he said, and we all refused to know that we knew. What makes self-deception so hard to overcome is we never consciously set out to deceive ourselves. A liar may get up in the morning and say, I'm going to lie to my wife today, but nobody ever says, I think I will lie to myself today. This is the double treachery of self-deception. First, we deceive ourselves, and then we convince ourselves that we are not deceiving ourselves. Reality is flagging us down with blinking lights, um, red signals, beeping beepers, anything to get our attention. But in a microsecond, we deny what we know, and then we deny that we are denying. Self-deception is the ability of the will in the grip of denial to encourage strongly wanted thoughts to come to consciousness and to strongly discourage unwanted thoughts to come to consciousness. And so we need help if we're going to know and live in the truth. Only the truth can set us free to deal with reality. And the strange thing is, even though you are yourself and I am myself, and you think we are the world's leading expert on ourselves, we are, every one of us, deeply self-deceived. And Scripture teaches that at the core of this is a problem of sin, that we don't want to know ourselves as we actually are. And so masters of the spiritual life invite us into the practice of self-examination with God's help in an atmosphere of truth and grace. I thought this is quite remarkable. Um, Lowney in his books talks about Peter Drucker. Many of you will know one of the great experts on leadership, organizational life, wise management uh, over the last generation. And this is what he wrote. This is Drucker. John Calvin and Ignatius Loyola incorporated ongoing self-assessment into the practice of their followers. In fact, the steadfast focus on performance and results that this habit produces explains why the institution those two men founded, the Calvinist Church and the Jesuit Order, came to dominate Europe within 30 years. That's Peter Drucker. So, uh, Here's the invitation for today. This is what Ignatius devoted himself to, and you might reflect on each of these abilities. The ability to reflect systematically on personal weaknesses, especially those manifested as habitual tendency. The Bible talks in one place about, be careful of the root of bitterness. Certain sins get rooted in me. The root of the need for approval and depressing other people is one of my rooted or habitual sins. To get very clear on this is a key part of self-awareness. An integrated worldview, a vision, and a value system. Anybody can claim a value system, but I think of a leader who is great at articulating vision, but then abuses of power and the misuse of women became... Uh, uh, a horrible reality because that value system was not integrated into a life. Profound respect for other people and for all creation. Appreciation of oneself as loved and important. That's part of what we need to reflect on on a regular daily basis. The ability to tune out everyday distractions in order to reflect and the habit of doing so daily. The 10th step in the 12 steps involves continuing to take personal inventory and when wronged, promptly admit it. And then finally, a method for considering choices and making decision. And Ignatius was great at this. We'll look at this also. But I want to invite you now to take a few moments, maybe right now, and to do a little reflection you might think about this day so far or yesterday from when you first woke up and then when you greeted people in your life as you got ready for the day, got dressed and so, drove someplace if you did that, opened up your computer, go from one scene to the next. God, where were you here? 
did I see you in the face of the people that I talked with, in the beauty of your world? Where was I afraid? Where was I excited? Where was I deceptive? Where was I thrilled to be following the values that I believe in most deeply? Where did I blow people off and ignore them? Where did I see your image in them? To invite God to show us the truth about ourselves, to reveal to us what the psalmist calls our hidden sins. That is a central gift for people who want to impact the world as it is. And that's you. And that's me. Make today count. Thanks for joining us here at becomenew.me. If you'd like to receive the daily emails that go along with each video, let us know at becomenew.me at gmail.com. Or if you want prayer, you can text us at 855-888-0444.